you got? Well, I've got a talking donkey. <laughs> right. Well, that's good for ten shillings. If you can prove it. Oh, I'd go ahead, little fella. Well? Oh, he just, he just a little nervous. He's really quite a chatterbox. Talk, you <gasps> boneheaded dog. That's it. Talk. I've heard enough. Guards! No, no, he talks. He does. I can talk. I'd love to talk. Get her out of my sight. No, no, I swear. No, he can talk. <gasps> hey, I can fly. He can fly. He can fly. fly. He can talk. <laughs> That's right, fool. Now I'm a flying talking donkey. You might have seen a house fly, maybe even a super fly, but I bet you ain't never seen a donkey fly. <laughs> All right, good morning, C3 Church. As you can tell, Pastor Gene's not here, so I am tasked with bringing the message. And if you uh, know, I'm excited today because uh, where the talking donkey originated is what we're going to talk about today. It actually came from the Bible. The Bible initiated the talking donkey, and we get a chance to talk about that. I'm excited because I love the Old Testament, and in Numbers, we're going to get a chance to see that there is a talking donkey in the Bible. Um, so we are going to go back to the book of Numbers, and we're going to see that. And I love going to the Old Testament. A lot of people skip over the Old Testament because we're New Testament, right? We, we belong in the New Testament. But the Old Testament is a great place to start reading. It is a place where God uses ordinary men to, you, to do his extraordinary will. And so today I get to go back into the Old Testament because Pastor Gene is in the New Testament. So I'm going back to the Old Testament. And for those who don't know me, my name is Tony. I am a volunteer here. My family volunteers here. Uh, we've been going to this church for two years. Um, I was a pastor at what you would call a mega church. I was on uh, executive pastor staff as the next gen pastor. So I was over all students and children's ministry. Um, so I have a little bit of experience, and that's why you see the video. I'm used to dealing with a much younger audience, but when I was dealing with them, uh, that video was old. Like I would make references to like Finding Nemo, and they would be like, "Who's who's? Oh, you mean Dory? No, I meant Nemo, man. That's the first movie that came out." But I was way older than my crowd. Um, so I'm excited to be here with you today and deliver the message. Um, Pastor Gene has been talking about something. Uh, he brought it up last week, and he started the message on what, how you identify as Christians how we are identified as Christians, and we're identified by the fruit that we produce. He even does a chart. And if you want to look at that message and you want to look at the chart, that's actually on our C3 app. You can download that, shameless plug, um, on any Apple or I, uh, uh, Google feature you want to. So I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that because we're going to talk about something that lays the foundation for what Pastor Gene's going to talk about. Today, we're going to talk about obedience because before you can bear good or bad fruit, you have to be obedient. You cannot bear good fruit and be disobedient. And obedience is tough. It goes against the world today. If you look on political venues, even in families, and some churches, rebellion is a common theme. And rebellion is much easier than obedience. And so when we go to numbers today, we're going to see that the first thing that we have to do in order to be identified as Christians, true followers of Christ, we must learn to be obedient. Now here's the deal. Let me put this plug. If you don't like this message, don't worry. Pastor Gene is back next week. And so if you're new here and you don't like it, come back next week. Our pastor will be back on stage. And it won't be the first time. I got a great story. I usually do. If you've heard this one, it's okay. You'll hear it again. But the first time, so uh, I went from being a banker and God called me back into the ministry. I actually graduated from seminary and left the ministry shortly after that. And then God called me back in and we had, I, I was on staff for about a year and a half as the next gen pastor. And then the pastor's like, hey, I'm going out of town. He would go out of town every July and he'd be gone for three weeks. And so there was three separate speakers, um, and usually it was from those that were on staff. And so uh, I was the third week, right before he got back, I got to get up and, and preach, and it was uh, four services, Saturday night, and then three on Sunday, and I thought it went well. People said it went well. I watched it. I was like, you know, that's pretty good. Well, the fourth week when Pastor uh, Brad is back, um, this little old lady, nicest lady in the world, man, she's the kind of lady that would bring you like mac and cheese and things like that. She was awesome. She walked up to me and she's like, hey, uh, I got a question. And she go, I go, yeah. And she's like, is Pastor Brad back? And I'm like, yes, he most certainly is. And she's like, good. Those other speakers, they didn't add up. And I'm just standing there. I'm like, you think she recognized 
that I spoke last week, and she said that to me. So if you don't like it, it's okay. Uh, Pastor Gene is back next week. Um, so we're going to be in Numbers chapter 22, Numbers chapter 22. And once again, we're going to see that God uses ordinary men and animals to relay his will. And, and we'll start with that in Numbers chapter 22, 1 through 6. So I'm going to do a brief summary, and then we'll get started. So 22, 1 through 6 starts with this. It's about the Moabites. They're the descendants of the incestuous offspring of Lot. Go back and read that story. They didn't like that the Israelites were beginning to lurk close to their lands during the Exodus. So we're now in the stage where the Israelites have exited captivity. So they're coming across the Moabites. And the Moabite king Balak knew how Israel had handled their other enemies, like the Amorites, the descendants of Canaan. These were fierce warriors. And, the, and the, guess what? The Israelites just wiped them out. And so Balak is thinking, here's this large group of people that are beginning to surround my land. They've wiped out people that are better and more fierce warriors than us, and he's beginning to get fearful. He's beginning to think that they're about to wipe my kingdom out. And so in his fear, he summons a prophet named Balaam to come and curse Israelite people. So we're going to pick up, that's 1 through 6, Numbers 22, 1 through 6, just a brief summary, and we're going to pick up Numbers 22, 7 through 14, and we're going to be introduced to someone who is not mentioned, uh, he's not previous, and he's not after, he's kind of like Melchizedek, if you go back, he's an Old Testament person that is mentioned, he kind of appears, and then just disappears. But in that short three-chapter frame that he's in, he gives us a great illustration of obedience to God. So we're going to pick it up uh, in Numbers 22, 7 through 14. Balak's messengers, who were elders of Moab and Midian, set out with money to pay Balaam to place a curse upon Israel. They went to Balaam and delivered Balak's message to him. Stay here overnight, Balaam said. In the morning, I will tell you whatever the Lord directs me to say. So the officials from Moab stayed there with Balaam. That night, God came to Balaam and asked him, who are these men visiting with you? As if God didn't know. Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent me this message. Look, a vast horde of people has arrived from Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come and curse these people for me. Then perhaps I will be able to stand up to them and drive them from the land. But God told Balaam, do not go with them. You are not to curse these people, for they are blessed. The next morning, Balaam got up and told Balak's officials, go home. The Lord will not let me go with you. So, This is the beginning of our story. We're introduced to Balaam. He's a prophet. Look at the first thing that happens with obedience. You're going to see the first thing is your obedience will stem from where your heart is. Your obedience will stem from where your heart is. Balaam's heart is identified almost immediately. You'll notice that he is a prophet for hire. In verse 7, and it, it says, and set out with money to pay Balaam. So they come up to pay Balaam to curse God's people. So you're going to see immediately, we see where Balaam's heart is. He's about the money. He's about physical possessions. As a matter of fact, this is confirmed later on. In 2 Peter 2.15, you don't have to turn there. It says this, And they have wandered off the, the right road and followed in the footsteps of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong. Balaam's heart is immediately identified in the wrong place. And here's the thing. Your obedience will go based on where your heart is. Your obedience will be based on where your heart is. If our heart's in the wrong place and we're following the wrong thing and our goals are not what God wants us to be, disobedience follows. Disobedience follows. As a matter of fact, the Bible immediately addresses Matthew 6. uh, The Bible immediately addresses the physical desires, right? The desire for money, the desire for fame. In Matthew 6, 24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for they will hate one and love the other, You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So immediately the Bible identifies that you cannot desire physical needs and God at the same time. As a matter of fact, if you go back and read the whole chapter of of chapter six, it's discussing how we as Christians should not need or want anything because God will supply. It goes into how God supplies for his own creation. Why wouldn't he supply for his chosen people? So the thing about it is this. There's nothing wrong with money. Money is not inherently evil. It's not wrong to make lots of money. It's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to have nice things. It's when we begin to put those things over the will of God that those things become a problem because that's where our heart is. That's what we're going to be obedient to. 
It's gonna affect our life choices. But let's go beyond money. In James 1, 6 through 8, it says, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything we do. You'll see that everything that a person does when your loyalty is divided, when you're trying to serve two masters, you're unstable. You're unable to do so. It is not possible to serve anything else and serve God. So where your heart is, that's where your obedience will be. Once again, there's nothing wrong with it. We kind of discussed it before. Some people, their heart is in their family. There's nothing wrong with family. But when it comes above how we serve God, it becomes an issue. Because our obedience and what we do shines more light to our family than it shines on God. So we instantly see here that Balaam is trying to serve the flesh. And that's where his heart is. Attempting to serve two masters will keep you from producing the good fruit that Pastor Gene's going to talk about. Listen, he's going to get into things, how you can produce good fruit and what causes us to produce bad fruit. And if you're trying to serve in the world, you're trying to be of the world and God, it's not going to work. You can't produce both good and bad fruit, right? You either bear one or the other. And so when we begin to try to like divide our loyalties and we're like, yes, I know God says to do this, but I really want to do this. It begins to show bad fruit. So our obedience is going to be determined by where our heart is. That's the first thing. The second thing is Balaam acted as if his obedience was a burden. Look in verse 12. It says, the Lord will not let me go, will not let me go with you. Have you ever had that before? Listen, I have kids. I have three boys. And when you tell them to do their chores, you would love for your kids to react like, yay, we get to do chores. I didn't react like that as a kid, so I don't know why I expected my kids to do it, right? But there's that obedience where it's like, fine, I have to go do my chores. And they sit there, and as they're watching you dish, as they're washing dishes, they're looking at you with the face like, I can't believe i got to wash these dishes, man. Or how about this, like, you know, you want to go somewhere, and you're like, ah, I'll give you a great example. I'm, I'm, I love to golf. I'm not good at it. I love to golf. Um, I'm not good at it, but you know, there are times when I'm like, all right, man, we get to golf. I'm going golf and I got a day off. It's a beautiful thing. And I will have forgotten as happens quite often. My wife maintains my schedule. She is it, like vital to my life. I couldn't live without her. That's a plug. She's back here volunteering right now, but that's the thing, right? And there are times when I'm like, I set up a golf thing and I'm ready to go golfing. And I tell her the night before I'm like going golfing tomorrow. And she's like, uh, no. And I'm like, well, why not? And she's like, because we already have this planned and scheduled. We've we've talked about this. We did? Was I watching golf at the time that we talked about it? Maybe football? Was I agreed to this? Yes? And then you call up your friends. You're like, I can't golf tomorrow because I got to do something. That's what Balaam's like right now. Balaam is like, listen, guys, I'd love to go with you. But, man, Jesus just won't let me go. Can you imagine if we acted like that when we had to obey? Like, listen, your friends are going out to do something you know is completely wrong, you shouldn't do, and instead of being like, you know what, you, you guys, do your own thing, I got, I'm going to do, do, you know, guys, I would, I would love to go with you and sin, but Jesus says I can't. It's just terrible. Can you imagine? That's not the way we're supposed to be as Christians. As a matter of fact, 1 John 5, 3 tells us that loving God means keeping his commandments, and these commandments are not burdensome. They're not burdens. God's commandments are not meant to be burdens. We're not supposed to be walking down as Christians like, oh, there's so many rules I have to follow. I can't believe this. No, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we should, be, we should have joy. We should be more joyful than any other people. It should be pressed down and boiling over. People should look at us and be like, what have they got that I don't? But when we walk around like, oh, I can't believe I'm not allowed to do this. We look like Christ gives us burdens. And his commands are not meant to be burdens. We can't look at them that way. We can't see them that way. We see Christ's commandments as a way to live a better life, as a way to be more Christ-like, as a way to direct people to salvation. 
Understand that what we have when we've accepted Christ, if you're a true Christian, which means you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, he rose again three days later, and he's in heaven now preparing a place for you. You believe all of that stuff. You've, you've bought into Christ. You are now saved. Can you imagine? You've just been saved from hell. I know it's not talked about a whole lot, but that's what salvation is. Normally, we focus on the good things about salvation. We don't focus on the anti-negative. The negative is, if you're not saved, you're going to die and spend eternity in punishment. Christ keeps us from doing that. How can we be burdened by anything he asks us to do? Christ's commandments are not burdens. Let's continue on with our story. Back in Numbers, chapter 22, verse 14 through 21. Balaam just keeps getting better. Then King Balak tried again. This time he sent a larger number of even more distinguished officials than those he had sent the first time. They went to Balaam and delivered this message. This is what Balak, son of Zippor, says. Please don't let anything stop you from coming to help me. I will pay you very well and do whatever you tell me to. Just come and curse these people for me. But Balaam responded to Balak's messengers. Even if Balak were to give me his palace filled with silver and gold, I would be powerless to do anything against the will of God. Sounds good. Sounds good, right? He, we, Balaam's got the message. But look what he says. But stay here one more night, and I will see if the Lord has anything else to say to me. Why would God change his mind? That night, God came to Balaam and told him, since these men have come to you, get up and go with them but do only what I tell you to. So the next morning, Balaam got up, saddled his donkey, and started off with the Moabite officials. What I believe we see here in these seven verses is this. The first thing you see is that King Balak tries again. And I'll tell you why. There's probably two reasons. First of all, because of Balaam's response. So understand the messengers would have relayed the message that Balaam says exactly. And they're like, he said he was wanting to come, but he told us his God wouldn't let him. Okay, so he does want to come. Maybe he just needs to be more motivated. And the second thing is, he's probably heard about Balaam before and some of the things that he's done previously and how he's been bought off previously. And so what we see here is the king sends even more distinguished officials, more money and offers more wealth. Balaam already had his answer. But he entertains, he gives a great answer here. He said, listen, even if Balak were to give me his palace filled with silver and gold, I, I would be powerless to do anything against the will of God. It sounds so good. It's perfect. And then the but. But stay here one more night. He already has the answer. He already knows what's going on. He could be obedient. He's obedient right there. If there's no but in our lives, where's the but? You know what? I'm the will of God, but there's this. Sometimes we have to realize that obedience requires sacrifice and faith. And this is something that bothers me because what's going on in today is that our new gospel that is out there, the prosperity gospel, warps things to show you that prayer is a tool to gain what we want. Oftentimes using scripture out of context, and we'll get to that in a second. But what we've learned or what we've been trained now by this newer culture of Christianity, is that if you pray enough, God will give you what you want. If you pray or give enough, God will give you what you want. Listen, there's no reason to sacrifice. There's no reason to have faith because if you pray or give enough, God's gonna give you what you want. And they point to verses. Pastor Gene talks about this a lot. When you read one verse out of context and don't read the rest of it, you can make it sound like it says whatever you want it to. I can take one line out of a two and a half hour movie and you'd be like, oh, well, that movie's great. And then you watch the movie and like, that's a terrible movie. Why would you watch that movie? So listen to this. Sometimes they'll point to James 4 too. They'll tell you, they'll be like, hey, James 4 too. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Listen, the reason why you don't have that new car is because you haven't asked God hard enough. The reason why you don't have that new job is because you haven't asked enough. Sometimes obedience is understanding that being obedient means you're sacrificing. You're sacrificing. And again, 
Our sacrifice compares nothing to the sacrifice on the cross. James 4, 3, the very next verse is what is often not read. And it says, even if you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Our motives and our obedience mattered. They matter. In Balaam's example, look, look, what do you think he's motivated here? When he says, but stay here one more night. Stay here one more night and let me see if God changes his mind. He's not motivated to see if God did change his mind and wants to curse the Israelite people. He's motivated because there's more distinguished officials and more money. And all of a sudden he's thinking, the king is going to give me whatever I want. I am going to be set for life. His motivation is now not obedience. It's back to self. Our obedience cannot be motivated by ourself. Look, he looks like he's doing right. He gives a great phrase, but his motives are in the wrong spot. If our motives for obedience is because we want to gain something out of it, we're no longer being obedient. We are no longer being obedient. Listen, if we're here in church today because our life is in shambles and there's something going wrong and I need something or I want something and we are in church for that very motivation, if I just come back to church, God's gonna put my life back on track. That's not the right motivation to be here. Now God can put your life back on track. Not a question. But when our motives are strictly to gain things, like, listen, I, in the ministry, we had lots of volunteers, and I knew volunteers, man, fantastic volunteers. And they would come to me, like, I want to volunteer. Great people. And they would volunteer, and they'd be like, you know what? I'm praying for this new job. I want God to give me this new job. And they would volunteer and be faithful every Sunday. They'd be in church every Sunday, and they, we would pray together about this job, and then they would get the job, and then the job took away from church, and then they were no longer here. And I often thought to myself, I'm like, what were your motives in the beginning? Were your motives to be in church because you needed a new job and you wanted God to bless you? Is that what our motives are? What, if our, what, what is our motives for obedience? Because here's the deal. If your motives are on, in the wrong place, you're not producing good fruit. You're not producing good, fr good fruit. Now, here's the deal. What we're going to find out is God can still use you in spite of your obedience, because we're going to find out Balaam gets used in spite of his disobedience. Now, God can still use you, but you are not going to be producing the fruit that you should be producing. And that's what this is about, right? We're, Pastor Gene is about to dive headlong into how we can produce good fruit. How we can produce good fruit. And in order to produce that, we have to be obedient. We have to have that foundation our ground's got to be, you got to toil the ground a little bit. You got to make sure the soil's, now I'm not a gardener. I'm not. Nobody in my family is, all right? So I don't know how that works, but there's work that's put in in order for things to grow, right? You can't just go out to your yard and be like, apple tree. Throw an apple out there and be like, I'll wait for that to happen. That is not going to work. Listen, my wife is in this room, and I will tell you, she does not have a green thumb. Plants tend to die, even cactuses. I don't know how. I thought they lived forever and like things. Listen, that's the thing. There's work put in to make things grow. To produce fruit, you got to work it. You got to work it. You got to work the soil. It's got to be ready to go. It's got to be, it's got to be cultivated. If we come in and we're like, I want to produce good fruit, but I'm not going to be obedient, your soil is not right. You're not going to retain. There's not going to be good fruit there. In order to move forward, we have to understand that we are going to be obedient and it is going to be hard. It's not easy. Now, can you imagine Balaam's excitement? Because we're going to get to a verse here. We're going to get to the last two verses. It says, that night God came to Balaam and told him, since these men have come for you, get up and go with them. Wait a minute. Did God just change his mind? Oh, hold on. But only do what I tell you to do. So the next morning, Balaam got up and saddled his donkey and started off. Can you imagine? Balaam is probably up before the sun rises because he's got what he wants. He's like, I'm going to be rich. I got money. I'm going to be powerful. Everybody's going to know my name. I'm never going to have to work again a day in my life. Can you imagine his excitement? Balaam thought he had got it. He thought he'd had it. 
Understand, God didn't change his mind here. God didn't all of a sudden go, you know what, Balaam, you're right. Let's go curse the Israelites, my chosen people. By the way, Balaam probably knew who the Israelites were. He probably had good knowledge. So he probably knew he was not going to be able to curse God's chosen people. If King Balak had heard about all the Israelites had done, Balaam had heard about all the Israelites have done. And he would have known that the God they serve is different, is powerful. And so God is moving Balaam into judgment because disobedience leads to judgment. Listen, here's the deal. I'm going to be flat out honest with you. We are a family church. We believe that as a family, we come together. We believe that we fellowship together. We believe that we pray together. We believe we help each other to grow through accountability. There's a lot of things. So there's a lot of open and honesty, and that's, this is who I am. I'm telling you right now, there was a moment in my life when I was set up to go to the ministry, and disobedience pulled me away, and judgment happened in my life. I stand before you today as a divorced man. I was divorced. I'm remarried now. God blessed me with a beautiful wife. But I'm divorced because of disobedience. The judgment part of my life was God said, you're not obeying me. We need to understand that there is judgment and discipline to disobedience. We need to understand that. Your life can change due to disobedience. God's not changing his mind. God didn't go, you know what, Tony? You should get divorced. That didn't happen. It was because of what I was doing. The judgment on my life was that. And so when we gather into judgment, when all of a sudden I would be concerned if something I'm praying for is not happening, not happening, not happening, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's happening. Wait a minute, why? Is this me? Am I pressing through doors that are not there? They're not opening? I'm making them open? It's not God's will for my life, but I'm gonna make it happen? And there's signs that tells us we're doing it. It's not like it's a surprise, It's not like you're walking to a cliff and you're just walking and all of a sudden you just fall off. No, there are signs along the way. God is telling you, this is not my will. Ah, nope, I don't want you to do this. Nah, nope, I don't want you to do this. Cliff. We have signs of disobedience. God will tell you and show you where he wants you to be if your heart is in the right place. If he's your one master that you're serving, It's not going to be a surprise. Balaam knew exactly what was going on. God didn't change his mind. He's just moving Balaam into judgment. And now we get to my favorite part of the story. You're wondering why we showed Shrek in the beginning. You're like, what is that opening? That's crazy. You know, it's the last time I may speak after the opening. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. Pastor Gene's going to watch this. and He's he's probably watching it right now going, huh, Shrek. All right, good way to open the message. But we get to my favorite part of the story. And listen, this is why the Old Testament is really super cool. These stories are amazing. So back to Numbers 22, 22 through 31. But God was angry that Balaam was going, but he said he could go. No, no, no. He's angry. He's out of his will. So he sent the angel of the Lord to stand in the road to block his way. As Balaam and his two servants were riding along, Balaam's donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. The donkey bolted off, Uh, bolted off the road into a field. But Balaam beat it and turned it back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood at a place where the road narrowed between two vineyard walls. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it tried to squeeze by and crushed Balaam's foot up against the wall. Balaam beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved farther down the road and stood in a place too narrow for the donkey to get by at all. This time when the donkey saw the angel... It lay down under Balaam. In a fit of rage, Balaam beat the animal again with his staff. Then the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak. Gave the donkey the ability to speak. And we're going to see something really strange here, right? Other than the donkey speaking. And the donkey says, what have I done to to you that deserves you beating me three times? It asked Balaam. And I want you to understand, Balaam doesn't go, a talking donkey? Are you serious? You can talk? Have you been able to talk this whole time? Have I, can I hear other animals talk? These are natural questions. If your dog walked up to you, my dog would walk up to me and go, hey man, make me a peanut butter sandwich. I do, I make them peanut butter sandwiches. But if they talk to me, my first thing would be like, what? I'm going insane. 
I've lost my mind. Can I hear other animals talk? What's the deal? No, no, Balaam responds, you have made me look like a fool, Balaam shouted. He responds to the donkey. So not only does he not question that the donkey can talk, he actually legitimately responds to it. And it, listen, it goes on. If I had a sword with me, I would have killed you. But I am the same donkey you have ridden all your life, the donkey answered. Have I ever done anything like this before? No, Balaam admitted. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the roadway with a drawn sword in his hand. Balaam bowed his head and fell face down on the ground before the angel. Understand what a crazy story, but God gives us the opposite of Balaam here. Because Balaam is disobedient, his heart's in the wrong place, he doesn't want to sacrifice, but the donkey gives us a great look at simple obedience. The donkey gives us a great look at what simple obedience looks like. Listen, it's a great example of an obedient believer. The donkey is a great example of an obedient believer. So we're going to leave here today, and the question is going to be this when you leave here today, right? This is your great, deep theological question that I want you to answer. Am I the donkey or am I Balaam? Which one am I? And so you're like, listen, the great thing about the, if you have kids back there, they're learning the same lesson we are, and I would ask them, are you a donkey? Is that what you are? Are you a donkey? Listen, I did this once. Uh, I, I did this story in the children's ministry one time, and I had them go all ask their parents, are you a donkey? My senior pastor then sent me a text message the following morning before a staff meeting. He goes, hey, I have people texting me asking why their kids are asking if they're a donkey. And I was like, that's so great, man. Kids will do whatever you tell them to do. You're like, go ask your mom and dad, are you a donkey? Yes. <laughs> you should be, but you're not. Right? The donkey is a great example of simple obedience. Look what it does. First of all, it moves according to God's will and not his own. It attempts to go one way and the other. It moves according to where the angel is. God is directing its path. The donkey's trying to take it. The donkey's like, nope, I'm not doing this. I'm going to go this way or that way. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Simple obedience means we move according to God's will and not our own. We move according to God's will and not our own. Now, here's the deal. Uh, my wife will tell you this again. I am not a guy that picks up signs easily. Like, so I often pray in my prayer life, which is painstaking to do, but I often pay, pray, God, make this, where you want me to do this, obvious. Help me out here, God. To lay on my heart what you want me to do in this situation, have somebody come into my life and tell me, let me know exactly what you want me to do because here's the deal, God. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Listen, I can tell you this. When I was growing up, and I grew up independent fundamental Baptist. Totally nothing like I am right now, right? We're non-denominational. Um, we believe everybody that believes. There is nothing that we should disagree on except the cross, right? That's the only thing that should ever be in question. As long as you believe in the cross and what it means, the rest we can talk about and do whatever with. But I grew up independent fundamental Baptist. And so here's the deal. I always heard these stories about how like when you're obedient and things happen, God takes care of you. And they always had these, these great examples of like God did this exact thing. He did this. I asked him and he did this exact thing. Usually it had to do with giving. Usually it had to be like, you know what? I gave my last bit of money and the next day there was a check in the mail. Like that was crazy examples of that. And I never had that happen to me. And, and uh, a couple years back, five years now, maybe six, six years back, we left Tampa uh, where we were at the mega church. We came down to a church on Marco Island and we began to work at a church in Marco Island. And the move was, was totally different. And so I was, all, I was nervous about where we were going. I was like, all right, I fasted uh, 13 days without food, um, which is a long time to go without food, by the way. But I was really serious about finding God's will in this thing. I'm like, God, do you really want us to leave Tampa? Because things are great. We've got a nice, nice townhouse. Things are going well. My wife is in the ministry with me. Moving down here meant she wasn't going to be. There were scenes that were changing. I'm moving my entire family to Naples. I'd never been to Naples before. It's beautiful, but I'd never been here before. 
And I was thinking, God, are you sure this is what you want me to do? Is this your will for my life? And so we got down here. And at first we were staying. Uh, some things happened and we ended up coming down quicker than we thought we were going to. And we ended up staying in a condo of one of the nice people at the church. They gave us a condo to stay in, and it was a very nice condo on a very nice golf course, by the way. I was like, oh, this is impressive. If this is the ministry down here, I'm in. We weren't supposed to stay there the entire time. So we're trying to find a place to live, and in Naples, it's a little bit expensive, even six years ago. And so we finally find this perfect place that we can afford on a monthly basis, and you know how it is. You find a place, and you're like, I can afford this monthly payment, and then they're like, but you've got to pay first, last, and security deposit, and you're going, What? I got to pay like nine grand to move into this place? Are you kidding me? And so here's the deal. We are two grand short of being able to move into this place. We are $2,000 short of being able to move into this place. And I'm like, God, we're looking for a place to live. This seems like the place you want us to go. It's affordable. Is this where you want us to go or is there somewhere else? Well, I had a a friend in the ministry who called me up. He was at the church we were at. He former pastor who came to the church where we were at in Tampa and he called me when I was down here, when we first down, moved down to Marco, and he's like, hey, man, God's laid it on my heart to send you $1,000. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome, bro. I appreciate it. I am so grateful for that, and we had a great conversation. He's like, I just want to say we appreciate all that you and your wife and your family did. We're going to send you $1,000. So in my mind, I'm like, all right, $1,000 down, $1,000 to go. Again, I had never had anything like this happen. So seven days later, a check comes in the mail. And I open the check. And I look at it, and it's for $2,000 from this individual. And instantly, still get goosebumps thinking about it, because I'm sitting in my my pastoral office, and I'm almost in tears because I'm shocked that this is happening. And I call up my friend, and I'm like, hey, man, did you miswrite this? Like, you you said you're going to send 1,000. He's like, you know, man, he's like, we got off the phone, and this guy is a prayer warrior. And he's like, I begin to pray, and God just put $2,000 on my heart. He's like, I don't know why. So he put $2,000 on it, so I wrote the check for $2,000. And I said, we needed exactly that to move into this place. And I was like, and I was praying if God was not going to give us the $2,000 to show us where to move. And so in that instance, God confirmed my obedience. He confirmed my obedience. What an amazing way to do it. It was awesome. I was dumbfounded, shocked. I'd never had that story before. Growing up in church, being in the ministry, I'd never had that happen before. And God did it. When we move according to God's will, God uses our obedience to take care of us. Now listen, I know what you're thinking because I think that way sometimes too. I'm being very obedient this year, God. Can I get a 1999 Dodge Viper fully loaded any minute now? And you wake up excitedly looking out the window. That's not the way this works. God takes care of our needs, not necessarily our wants. When I look back with my wife at the times we're in the ministry, and I'm like, how did we make it? Like, I I look at what we make now compared to what we made then, and I'm like, "How how did that happen? God took care of every need we had, never a question. When we're obedient and we live according to God's will, our needs are met. We move according to God's will. So the donkey moves according to God's will. Listen to this. It remains obedient through tribulation. It's beat three times by Balaam. It's beat three times by Balaam. Sometimes we're obedient once. It doesn't, turn, it doesn't work out well for us. We go through tribulation. We're like, oh, I'm not doing this again. I'm not doing this again. I'm done. Walking away. I obeyed God and look what happened. I obeyed God and I lost my job. I obeyed God and I lost my job. I can't do it that way. I obeyed God and my family doesn't care about me anymore. They don't love me. They don't want to talk to me. I obeyed God and all of a sudden my friends walked away. My life is not as fun. No, see, we go through tribulation with obedience and we tend to think, you know what? I can't do it. I'm being obedient. I don't understand why my life isn't perfect. It's because it's not guaranteed to be that way. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews 5, 8, it tells us this. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Now, this is not saying that Christ was ever disobedient. But as 100% man and 100% God, he learned obedience means enduring suffering. Think about his final plea right before the cross. If there's any way for this cup to pass over me. Praying and sweating drops of blood. 
if there's any way to avoid this suffering. And then he says, not my will, but thine be done. God realized that obedience, Jesus realizes that obedience means enduring suffering. Oftentimes our obedience will mean tribulations because it's not understood by those who are around us. It's not understood why we would need Sundays off. It's not understood why we should be in church on Sunday. Listen, I'll give you a story. Again, I'm pointing to myself here. We went through COVID, right? And everybody went virtual. Everybody went virtual church. And church became a lot more convenient. I don't know about you guys, but watching church and worshiping while eating syrupy waffles in my pajamas, never better. I'm, I still want you to come to church, okay? But I'm just telling you from a human perspective, I enjoyed it. I, I was sitting there eating a waffle and like, this is a great message. It became convenient. And you know what? A little, it became a little more convenient because the message was recorded. So now I could do stuff on Sunday morning. And I can come back and watch the message, and I didn't feel bad about it. So I began to play golf on Sunday morning. Like, play golf, come back, and watch the message. Only after time, you didn't watch the message, and you're like, ah, oh, just watch it sometime throughout the week. And it became very convenient to not suffer. I played golf. I got to do what I wanted on Sunday. I was free. And then I realized something. My boys are watching this. They're watching me not care about church. What does that say about the God that I apparently love? Can you imagine if we said we loved our parents, our wives, spouses, kids, and then we never spent time with them? Like oftentimes I give the example, you say you love God, but then we're only here for an hour. And that hour sometimes we're like, is he almost done? Is he about to wrap this up? I got to go. Well, COVID allowed us not to even worry about the hour. There was no suffering. And listen, sometimes to come to church, it's a process, right? We're human. It's been a long week. I worked last night. I have kids that I have to get up and get ready. For those that had little kids, God bless you. I'm over that stage. I don't have to do that anymore. There's things that, like, sometimes it's not easy to come to church. And so the easy decision sometimes is, yeah, just catch up with it later. No suffering. Obedience requires us to suffer sometimes and endure it. Listen, we need to understand this. The donkey gives us a great illustration here. His last thing that he gives us, the last thing I love. The donkey understands that obedience can be spurred by the fear of God, not reverential. We're talking legitimate fear. I'll give you a great story. My dad was military, army, hardcore army. Now, I knew my dad loved me, and I love my dad. There's no question. I just got done with Tennessee. I went up and helped my dad do some things. I love my father. And my father loved me. He showed it all the time. He told me it was great. But you know what? I oftentimes didn't obey my dad because the love factor, right? That was not always the time. I was legitimately afraid of my dad. I watched that man do things no human should be able to do. Like when I, I played football, so I was in decent shape, I thought I'd outrun him. Nope. Former army, he just runs. I'm like, how? He's like 50. How am I not keeping up with this guy? I've watched him pick up things that no person, like tree stumps. He, used to, he came back and did landscaping for a while, and he'd pick up these logs, and he'd throw them on his shoulder. And I was like, man. Not only that, I got spanked by my dad. We had a paddle, all right? We had a paddle. It had tape around the handle. It felt like it was like nine inches thick, but it was only like two and you pleaded to be spanked by your mom. Like, when you got home, you're like, Mom, I was really bad in school. You can spank me now. The worst thing is when she would send you to a room and be like, wait till your father gets home. The anticipation was worse than the spanking. And out of fear, there were times that I obeyed my dad's rules. Out of fear. I remember one instance, I was late for curfew. I, was, I just now got my car. I was free at last, 16 years old, driving in a Sintra. I was going where I wanted to go, and I was supposed to be home by 11, and it was like 11, 12. I turned off my car and pushed it into the driveway from like three houses down. I was like, I'm pushing this car. I'm sure the neighbor's like, is that man, is he pushing his car? He's pushing his car. Nobody came out and offered help, by the way. But out of fear, I pushed my car into the driveway. Listen, we should have that fear of God as well. 
I know it's talked about that it's reverential. We're, we're in awe of God. No, 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 no. God controls every breath you take. And we have the nerve to be disobedient. I was afraid of my dad paddling, and yet I'm not in fear that God goes, you know what? Your disobedience has gone too far. And you know what? Here's the deal. That fear is very biblical. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says this. That's the whole story. So he's concluding the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, Pastor Gene talks about it. You know, there's a time and place for almost everything, right? Vanities of vanities, all vanities. And he goes into this whole thing. And then Ecclesiastes 12, 13, he said, that's the whole story. He's gonna conclude. Here now is my final conclusion on life, by the way. What is it all about? He says, this is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commandments, for this is everyone's duty. Fear God. We need to have a good, healthy fear of who God is. I know there's the phrase, no fear, K-N-O-W. When I was growing up, that was a big deal. No fear. No, no, no. It should still be, you should be afraid. You should know fear because God is in control of everything and he set down commandments for us to obey. So if there are times you can't obey a God out of love, you should obey him because what are the consequences to my disobedience? What are the consequences to my disobedience? And listen, there's nothing wrong with that. You're obedient. You're obedient because the Bible tells us to, because here's the deal. If I don't obey, this is what could happen. Can you think if Balaam would have thought this way, how this story would have been different? The first time if he would have sent him away and been like, hey, 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 nope, 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 those are God's chosen people. Don't even ask me that question. I'm not gonna pray about it. I don't want you to stay around. Those are God's chosen people. You can get up out of here, man. I've seen what God has done to those who have turned against God's people. You can leave. Had he done that, that's probably the right response but he didn't. And listen, we're going to stop here, but this is not the end of Balaam's story. I want you to go home and I want you to read uh, the rest of 22, 23, and 24. Go home and study this uh, because this is not the end of Balaam's story. Balaam continues on with God's permission. Listen, the only reason God gave him permission is because Balaam asked another dumb question. He's like, I'll only continue if you want me to. So Balaam shows later on that, hey, I'm still, listen, God, I, I did wrong. I'm going to repent. And I'll only continue if you want me to. Of course God doesn't want you to continue. He doesn't want you to curse his people. But what we see is Balaam goes and actually against King Balaam, God uses Balaam to actually bless the Israelites instead of cursing them. As a matter of fact, on three different occasions from three different locations, Balaam blesses the children of Israel instead of cursing them. And then in the fourth one, he actually gives a promise, a prophecy of the coming Messiah. It cost Balaam everything. It not only cost him his opportunity to be a true servant of God, because in the beginning, he's disobedient. But Balak is like, you can go away and leave. You can get out of here. And you best believe, just like the, the talk when in the beginning, when Balak is like, King Balak's like, man, who can I look for? Oh, this guy Balaam, you pay him enough, he'll curse somebody for you. Well, now King Balak is like, hey, I offered this guy everything, and he didn't do what I asked him. So now his racket is ruined. So he's not only disobedient to God and facing the wrath of God, he now faces the wrath of man and the fact that his racket is ruined. He's done. He's no longer going to get money for being a quote-unquote prophet. And he disappears out of the Bible as quickly as he shows up. Listen, if, if we are to bear good fruit, we must be obedient. We can't live in the flesh. We must choose who our master is Realize obedience is not a burden. We must move according to God's purpose and realize obedience may mean trials and pain, but they are temporary. Now here's the deal. We're gonna end on a Christ teaching because I can't out-teach Christ. Jesus was the ultimate teacher. I can't add or take anything away from what he said. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close with reading this passage. And I just want you to think about and let things settle about what Jesus is about to say about obedience. What Jesus, he's about to lay down a lesson to some Pharisees about obedience. Matthew 21, 28 through 32. But what do you think about this? 
A man with two sons, and this is Jesus talking, a man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of these two obeyed his father? They replied, the first. Then Jesus explained this meaning. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him, while tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe and repent of your sins. Thank you very much. Thank you.